Thanks, Johan and Robert, for the invitation and uh, pleasure to uh, have the chance to speak at this meeting. So in his opening remarks, Robert was mentioning that, you know, the meeting brings together people working on from the foundations of quantum mechanics side and a sort of logical uh, perspective with people coming from physics and condensed matter ideas and so on. So I'm, this talk is definitely from the former direction, but uh, I'll try and make it uh, generally uh, accessible, hopefully. I should say this is joint work with uh, Rui Barbosa, and some of the ideas were presented at the recent uh, QPL conference. So in fact, our starting point is what's often, I mean, well, the, the seminal reference in contextuality, the famous paper by Cochin and Specker from 1967. Um, it's interesting that Cochin and Specker were actually both logicians. Uh, so the fact that there is a connection with, with logic is, is not so surprising. Um, but uh, it turns out that in some sense, this insight about contextuality is one that uh, does seem to pick out one of the most characteristically quantum features of quantum theory. Um, and um, I should also mention that, that the, there was later work by Conway and Cochin. Unfortunately, the part of their, their, their joint work that became particularly well known was sort of advertised under the name of the free will theorem. And in my opinion, this is actually not so interesting, but the, the things that I think are interesting are actually less, uh, less widely known. Um, so what I want to say is that I think, although there's been now a big literature and things picking up from this classic reference from 50 years ago, I think there are some subtle ideas from these works which have not been fully picked up in, the, in all the subsequent work. And, uh, and I, uh, I've been sort of uh, trying to understand that uh, a bit better. In fact, my attention was drawn to this uh, when there was a meeting to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Coach and Specker paper at Perimeter Institute, uh, one in 2017. And there was actually a, a very nice lecture by Simon Cochin, who attended the meeting. And that got me to looking at some of his more uh, recent work. Anyway, the things I want to discuss, or hopefully discuss time permitting, firstly, this logical perspective on contextuality, what I'll call the logical exclusivity principle. And the exclusivity principle has been quite widely discussed in recent times as a sort of distinctive principle of quantum theory and propounded as such, for example, by Adan Cabello and others. Um, I want to look at Koch and Specker paradoxes, as we call them, and I, I think uh, we can refer to them as quantum conditions of impossible experience. This is a sort of uh, slightly a pun because uh, George Boole, the, uh, we're going to be talking about Boolean algebras, also the father of modern logic and probability, and he had a famous paper from around 1850 about conditions of possible experience, and it turns out that he was essentially talking about Bell inequalities. This was realized some years back by Itamar Pitofsky and others. And actually, pretty much the whole story of Bell inequalities is in this 1850 paper by Boole. And in some sense, the Coach and Specker work is talking about quantum conditions of impossible experience, as I'll try and explain. And um, uh, we still by no means fully understand uh, that uh, insight, I think. And finally, time permitting, I'd like to say a bit about the logic of uh, tensor products. Okay, so just to begin with a little background, and maybe, I hope this may be helpful for people coming more from the physics side. So I think it's sort of, a, in, in a sort of a mathematical physics perspective, it would be fairly standard to say that we can distill the distinction between classical and quantum physics in terms of C-star algebras. So we can think of classical physics as living in the world of commutative C-star algebras. And by Gelfand duality, these can be seen as function algebras on topological spaces. So an observable is a function on a, on a, a and the space is representing, say, the phase space, determining the state of the system we're studying. And so each observable has a well-defined value 
on every state of the, uh, of the system. Um, and then quantum physics, of course, lives in general non-commutative C-star algebras, and these can always be seen as subalgebras of the operators on a Hilbert space. So, so non-commutativity is a central idea. Um, now we can take a further step, which was already taken, of course, by Birkhoff and von Neumann, von Neumann whose mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics we're still using, and, and sort of take the essence further to the projectors, which we can think of as playing the role of uh, basic propositions or properties. So this was the Birkhoff von Neumann move to uh, so-called quantum logic. However, uh, as von Neumann admitted, there is an issue with a physical interpretation of what seem like natural logical or algebraic operations on non-commuting projectors. Since projectors represent subspaces and subspace, closed subspaces are closed under intersection, it's tempting to take that as an operation. But really, what does it mean to multiply non-commuting projectors operationally or uh, physically? And so this led to the interestingly different thing that Cochin and Specker did. What they did was to represent non-commutativity and hence incompatibility by saying that the operation should be partial. In other words, you're only allowed to form the product of projectors if they commute. And also you can extend this to uh, self-joint operators and so on. So they were dealing with partial algebras or if you like, uh, going to projectors with propositions, uh, but in a, in, a, in a partial kind of logic. And this leads to the idea that what makes sense is really what lives in these, in these sort of subsets where things do commute and are compatible, and incompatibility divides us into different islands, uh, different contexts, where, uh, and in, in each context, things make sense classically, but as you move between the contexts, you, um, uh, the story is different, and, you, and you, in general, you can't move between uh, contexts in a, in a well-defined fashion. So this already starts to sound perhaps much more familiar as a modern perspective on, on uh, contextuality. So in fact, this, this sort of a move by Cochin and Specker to say that non-commutativity and hence sort of conceptually incompatibility is represented by partiality. So this leads to their notion of partial Boolean algebra. So Boole is gonna to be to the fore in, uh, in this talk. So Boolean algebra is really the algebraic version of circuits. So this is, you know, as indeed Andrew was describing, a sort of core way of looking at classical computation. And then from the Coach and Specker picture, we can see this variation by going to partial Boolean algebras as being a sort of essence of uh, quantum theory. So what is a partial Boolean algebra in the abstract? So it's given by a, by a set of elements, and then as usual, we have constant zero, one. We're gonna have the usual signature, the same one that Anuj was describing, and, or, and not. But now we have a reflexive symmetric binary relation which we can read as compatibility or co-measurability. And while the negation is a total operation, the and and the or are partial operations whose domain is given by this binary relation. So binary relation is a set of ordered pairs uh, and uh, you can only form the conjunction or disjunction of things which are co-measurable. So that's the idea. And then here's the, the sort of uh, key property that they required every set of pairwise commensurable elements must be contained in a larger set of pairwise commensurable elements, which forms a total Boolean algebra under the restrictions of the given operations. So in other words, we can form commuting um, uh, subalgebras which behave like classical ones. And, and commutation or commensurability, one should say in this setting, is a binary notion. Incidentally, this binary notion is this binarity of quantum mechanics uh, is really what should be called Specker's principle, because if you look at the sort of actual quotations from the things that he wrote and said at various times, that was the point that he was emphasizing. And this is, of course, a familiar point. If you think about commutativity, then commutativity is a pairwise operation. If you have a set of op operators which pairwise commute, then you say the whole set commutes. Um, and the famous kind of non-example 
um, for um, forming a kind of quantum paradox is it's what's often called Specker's triangle, where you have um, three things that pairwise commute, but the, the, the sort of contradiction is in, is in the three of them, but this can't happen under this, this, binarity, um, this binarity condition, so it has no quantum uh, realization. Now, the, uh, the binarity is, well, it won't be a main focus of what we say, but it's, built, it's baked into their notion of partial Boolean algebra. Mathematically, one could consider some more general um, setting, but, but for the connection with, with quantum theory it's, uh, uh, that we're going to use, it's, uh, it's the right notion. And just to clarify, since we're going to be talking about uh, Boolean subalgebras or partial Boolean algebras a lot, whenever I just say Boolean algebra, I mean total Boolean algebra. So if it's a partial algebra, I'll say partial. And of course, the key example is going to be the projectors on a Hilbert space. So this is very familiar, um, but we're now viewing it as a partial structure. Uh, so the operation of conjunction uh, is only defined on commuting projectors. And of course, the product of commuting projectors is again a projector. Uh, uh, Complement is a total operation, and then disjunction also is defined on commuting operations. So this is the, uh, this is the manifestation in, uh, in quantum mechanics. So this is the difference from the Birkhoff von Neumann view where they took the lattice of projectors or subspaces with a total operation of the intersection of uh, subspaces. Okay, so we have some structures, so we, we can should make a category of them. So, so the morphisms are simply, um, maps which preserve the commensurability and then the operations wherever defined. And in a very nice paper uh, some years back, Chris Hernan and Benno van der Berg showed that every partial Boolean algebra is the co-limit of its Boolean subalgebras. And really we see that from this point of view, Cochin and Speck already had the essence of what more recently was, I mean, developed in a more modern language by uh, Chris Isham, uh, Jeremy Butterfield, Andreas During, and others as uh, the uh, a sort of topos view, also developed by the uh, Nijmegen school in a, in a different form, that um, uh, in some sense the, the quantum structure is a collection of classical commutative structures in a, in a certain sense. Now, um, what is a co-limit of partial Boolean algebras? I mean, that's the statement here, but what is a co-limit? Uh, well, it's very easy to describe co-products. The co-product of partial Boolean algebras is essentially the disjoint union, except that you have to remember to glue the zero and one elements together. But otherwise, you see how partiality arises very naturally. Nothing that comes from A, other than zero and one, is commensurable with anything that comes from B, and vice versa. On the other hand, for general co-limits, um, it's not so easy to show that they exist. And what uh, Hernan van der Berg did was appeal to the adjoint functor theorem. Um, and actually it turns out we can give a direct description, which turns out to be, I mean, it leads to a more general construction, which we're gonna use a lot. So let me say a little bit about it. So essentially what we're doing is to freely, to start with a given partial Boolean algebra, and then add additional commensurability relations among the elements of the partial Boolean algebra to get a new partial Boolean algebra. Um, and well, you, you may wonder why we want to do that. We'll see many, many ways that this comes up naturally. So here, here is firstly the formal result. Given a partial Boolean algebra and an arbitrary binary relation on A, then there's a new partial Boolean algebra. I write like this, A uh, square brackets, the relation we're extending by. Uh, so firstly, we can, we can embed the original uh, partial Boolean algebra into this new one uh, in such a way that the relation, uh, whenever the relation held, this extra relation held between two elements, the images uh, are now commensurable. So we turn the relation into part of the commensurability relation. And moreover, it's the universal such construction. Whenever you have a, a morphism which, which takes this arbitrary relation into commensurable elements of B, 
then it factors uniquely through this uh, extension. And um, what also turns out to be useful is that we, I mean, we could also prove this by the adjoint functor theorem, but um, uh, we get benefit by proving it in a more constructive fashion. I'm not going to belabor this point, but we sort of build a free algebra by a syntax of terms, um, only it's a little more, and, and then quotienting out by the equations that we want, only it's a little more complicated than that because it's a partial algebra. So in fact, we, we do something like this, where we, we define simultaneously three things. We have these terms which may or may not be defined. So down arrow says that a term is defined. Then we have the commensurability, which we can infer to hold between various elements and the, the equations that we want, which is this uh, equivalence, this triple bar relation. So I won't dwell on this, but it, uh, just to say that it works. Um, that has a number of variants that are also useful. So in particular, if we want not just to extend commensurability, but force equality, then we can do that with a single additional rule. Um, and then that gives us this variant of the construction. And um, from this, it's very easy to get uh, co-equalizers and therefore general co-limits. All right, so that's a Thumbs little on. bit of... I don't know. Can you hear me? Thumbs yes. on, can you hear me? Yes. This is Robert. Uh, can you slow down a bit, perhaps? And do you have an example? I mean, for physicists, something simple. Can you explain um, what, what you just had on the three previous slides in a simple example? I'm going to give examples of the use of this construction, but... Um, Okay, um, right. I mean, uh, okay, thanks for the warning Sorry, to go a bit slower, yes. yes. Um, I mean, I, I, maybe it's useful to say this. Um, uh, where are we? Uh, co-products. Let's just understand co-products. Let's think of the projectors on C2. The projectors on C2 are well known to, ha to be sort of, uh, to have a hidden variable theory. Uh, and let's understand what the structure of C2 is. So just the one qubit space and the projectors. So if you think about uh, any, uh, any sort of unit vector, then uh, its, its complement already forms a, obviously a base, an orthonormal basis of C2. So we're going to get from the, uh, a little commuting algebra with just four elements in it from any given, uh, any given uh, projector. And actually, what's, what P of C2 is, is the co-product of, in fact, an uncountable number of copies of the four-element Boolean algebra, all just glued together at the top and bottom elements. So that's, relatively speaking, concrete. And we can obviously, we can think about finite parts of that. As we know, once we go to P of C3 and P of C4, things are very different because there's now sharing of, the, of different subalgebras in a non-trivial way. Uh, and, that mean, and that's where we start to get a co-limit where we have to coalesce these different copies. In, in the case of P of C3, then the maximal Boolean subalgebras will actually be eight element Boolean algebras. So one can kind of check that. And then of course they overlap in, uh, they, may, they, may be, they may have vectors or projectors rather in common. So that starts maybe to give a picture of how these things look. Uh, Thank you. Okay. All right. So, uh, yes. Samson, there's a question, I think, from the attendees. Uh, Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm sorry. Could you go back to the slide with the theorem? Yes. Uh, just before, yeah, here. Right. So I'm new to category theory. And my question would be, um, so here, essentially, what I'm understanding is that you're extending A into uh, a bigger Boolean algebra, which is partial. A bigger partial Boolean algebra. Right. Yes. And I would, uh, and my question would be, would it make sense or is it even interesting to consider uh, the converse implications? So, for example, A product B, instead of implying right, but implying the other way, in the first condition and uh, similarly for the second condition, so that you would go to a smaller Boolean algebra. A smaller partial Boolean algebra. 
Well, uh, for, our, for our applications, this is the this is the construction that we want. Uh, I mean, if we want to embed, notice that if we want to embed A into another partial Boolean algebra, then by definition of what a morphism is, commeasurability or compatibility, if you if you like, has to be preserved. So at least the commeasurability in the new one has to be as big. Uh, intuitively as the one that we started off with. And what we're interested in here is saying, not only do we want to already have the commensurabilities that we had, we want to have, we want to see if we can get some more. And, and the way to think of that um, is, I mean, as to why we'd be interested in that direction is the more commensurability we have, the more classical we are in, in some sense. And we'll have a bit more to say about that later. Does that right. help? Right. Yeah, that helps. I was, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why we're interested in that direction. Okay, thanks for the question. Okay, so now, I mean, this. Uh, I mean, the Samson, there's, there's, another, there's another, there's another question. question. Okay, fine. Go ahead. Uh, Hello. Sorry. Uh, it was. It wasn't really a question. It was more of a comment regarding the last question. So I. I don't think it's very. So the this this new extension is not necessarily a larger Boolean algebra. So maybe it's worth clarifying this point. Um, yes. yes. It, it, so it's it, just it, that it, A will map into this other Boolean algebra, but it's it won't necessarily be a larger Boolean algebra because sort of these might force some things to be identified. So, but maybe you want to. Yeah. That, that's uh, a, that's a, very, which will which will come back to a bit later. Um, and in fact, if when we go to the co-limits, we are very interested in identifying things. A co-limit, co-equalizers here essentially are quotient constructions where we want to force some things to be identified. So if we make this version, then we will identify things. I think maybe this, when we come to the actual cochin becker paradoxes and so on, we'll see some more about this issue of identification. Okay, so a partial Boolean algebra is like an event algebra in the same way that if you have, a, you, know, you have an underlying Boolean algebra or sigma algebra of events when you have a probability distribution. Um, so where, where do the probability distributions or the states uh, live? Well, they, they live, they can be defined naturally on partial Boolean algebras. So a state for a partial Boolean algebra is just a mapping from the Boolean algebra to probabilities to the unit interval, which satisfies these conditions, which are the sort of partialized versions of the usual definitions for a, a technically finitely additive probability measure. So it should be, should have the right behavior with respect to complements. Um, and then just when things are co-measurable, we have the usual uh, additivity, finite additivity property. We're not going to get into, I mean, we could go to sigma additive, but we'll, we won't need to consider such things and it keeps it simpler. And in fact, uh, it's easy to see that, you know, with this philosophy that we're looking at these classical contexts, classical subalgebra, Boolean subalgebras, in fact, one can see that states can be characterized as those maps whose restriction to every Boolean subalgebra is a finitely additive probability measure in the usual sense. Okay. So, um, and in fact, um, <clears throat> if one, um, again, from a kind of a category theory, uh, sort of sheaves, topos theory kind of point of view, uh, uh, this sort of uh, relates to the two things. So a state on a partial Boolean algebra is the same thing as a family of finitely additive measures on the Boolean subalgebra, so, which have to fit together in the right way. In other words, whenever one is the uh, is a whenever you have one Boolean subalgebra included in another, then um, the one uh, one measure is simply the restriction of the of the other. Uh, okay. <clears throat> well, let me come on now to this exclusivity principle. So there's been a lot of discussion about this in the quantum information quantum foundations literature recently under various names such as uh, local orthogonality, consistent exclusivity, or Specker's principle. As I said earlier, 
Specker's principle, in Specker's own words, is really this binarity feature of quantum mechanics. But anyway, uh, I'll refer to it as the probabilistic exclusivity principle uh, because it's expressed in the, usually as a constraint on probability assignments. Now, informally, it says what may seem to be hardly to need saying that if we have a family of pairwise exclusive events, the sum of their probabilities must sum to less than or equal to one. Now, of course, if we were in the classical case and all the events lived in a single sample space, this would just be a basic property of uh, probability measures. Um, in fact, it would be a, a, a sort of subadditivity again. What gives the condition its force is that these events might live in general over different incompatible contexts. And thus it reaches beyond the usual view of context as different classical windows on a quantum system in which incompatible contexts are regarded as incommensurable. So uh, we're, we're comparing things that live in, in, in different contexts and still having a coherent relationship between them. And it's important to say that quantum mechanics, of course, satisfies this principle, because if you think about different projective measurements, for example, then um, they can, I mean, the way they would be pairwise exclusive is that they would have uh, sort of projectors that are orthogonal to each other, and then it would fall out very easily that this, uh, if you took those projectors out and summed them, that they would be part of a resolution of the identity, and hence they would sum to less, uh, any, uh, any uh, quantum probability would sum to less than or equal to one. Okay, so now we want to look at exclusivity principles from the perspective of partial Boolean algebra. So we're actually going to consider two exclusivity principles. like you to unmute. Is there, is there a problem with sound? Uh, so far I could hear you, you Samson. Yes. Okay. All right. I was just like I got muted for some reason. Okay. So you can hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is introduce two exclusivity principles. One will act at the logical level, which is in keeping with this sort of general philosophy, philosophy of focusing on the underlying event space, the partial Boolean algebra. And the other one is at the probabilistic level and applies to the states. And now I'm having a, ah, oh yes. So um, <clears throat> we say that two events are exclusive in a partial Boolean algebra if they have inconsistent uh, consequences, if they entail, uh, one entails some piece of information C and the other entails a piece of information not C. So there's a direct contradiction between them. Now, th where does this entail come from? Well, in any partial Boolean, al in any Boolean algebra, you have a, a partial order, um, which can be defined like so. And, um, in the case of a, of a partial Boolean algebra, all you need to say is that two things are related, they have to be commensurable, and then the same condition holds. So in other words, they both have to belong to the same Boolean subalgebra, and then they're, they're related in that way. So even though two things may not be commensurable, they could still, there could still be enough information there that one of them is, uh, has imply something which is contradictory to uh, what the other one is saying. So that's our notion of exclusivity. Uh, so one, as I say, one might have exclusive events that are not commensurable, and for which therefore the conjunction would not be defined. And then we say that a partial Boolean algebra satisfies the logical exclusivity principle if any two events that are logically exclusive are in fact also commensurable. Uh, and we get a subcategory of Boolean algebras that satisfy this principle. And now we can define this probabilistic exclusivity principle, which is a version of the thing that has been studied in a lot of the recent uh, literature on contextuality, just by saying uh, a state is, satisfies this probabilistic version of the principle. If for any set of pairwise exclusive events, uh, the, the sum of their probabilities under the state is uh, bounded by one. So this is a fairly direct version of the condition we were stating intuitively before. 
And we say that a partial Boolean algebra satisfies this principle if all of its states do. Um, and of course, if, if we were in a Boolean algebra where everything was commensurable, then automatically um, this, would be, this would be satisfied. But there are certainly um, partial Boolean algebras of, of quantum events which uh, don't satisfy this principle. And actually a lot of the discussion that's been in the recent literature is exactly about that situation. Um, so what we can say immediately is that logical exclusivity implies probabilistic exclusivity. That's very easy to see. But uh, in a general partial Boolean algebra, not all states need to satisfy this principle. And a well-known example is the state on the partial Boolean algebra. That we, can, we can form, I haven't gone into this, but we can take the usual kind of Bell scenarios and turn their events into um, partial Boolean algebras, where in each context, in each choice by Alice and Bob or other participants of an observable, we get it, we get a we get, um, we get um, a Boolean algebra, a Boolean subalgebra, where they've made that choice of each agent has made that choice of measurement. Now, it, uh, so a well-known example is if you take the tensor product of two copies of the PR box, then uh, we get something which does not satisfy the probabilistic exclusivity principle. And the the hope behind the discussion of this principle is that it might help to sort of get rid of these non-quantum examples that, that we know live in um, uh, non-locality and contextuality scenarios. Now, the idea, the point is that using our, con our construction, so this is uh, um, one of the reasons we introduced it, we can build from the event algebra we started off from, the partial Boolean algebra A, a new one, Whose states, uh, whose states will be um, uh, will uh, will enforce that they that can only be such that they satisfy probabilistic exclusivity. So we can fix, as it were, the non-quantum leak of things that don't satisfy probabilistic exclusivity by a logical um, construction applied to the partial Boolean algebra. So. Um, uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, we, if we have a partial Boolean algebra, we extend it now by this exclusivity relation. So this just becomes an example of the general construction we saw earlier. Then, um, then it's easy to see that a state will satisfy um, this uh, on the original uh, our original partial Boolean algebra A will satisfy probabilistic exclusivity if there's a state. Um, which uh, makes this uh, commute. So this is a, a variation of the, the sort of property for the universal property for partial Boolean algebras that we discussed before. Now uh, there's a sort of technicality here that while by extending by this exclusivity we enforce that uh, exclusivity holds for the, uh, for the events we started off with, we may also generate new events for which it doesn't hold. But we can actually adapt the proof of um, our previous result to enforce exclusivity in um, uh, throughout the new Boolean algebra that we construct, and we get. And technically, this is uh, we can we can in a universal fashion take any partial Boolean algebra in a in a in a universal way into one that satisfies this logical exclusivity principle so technically it's a co-reflection into uh, a subcategory and we can turn the same handle of the kind of construction we glimpsed previously um, with a with a with a minor uh, variation to build in the um, uh, exclusivity principle okay so um that's um I think that that sort of shed some light on um, how exclusivity works a bit more generally than has been previously considered. And when we add in our discussion of tensor products, that we would also get a notion of exclusivity that is closed under tensor products, which has been actually a, a problem with uh, the notions that have been considered till now. But I want to move on from that now. And how much time do I have at this point? Uh, I'm uh, okay, so until uh, 
9.45. So it makes uh, right. 13, so 13 15, minutes. 14, 15, yeah. yeah, right. Okay, fine. So I want to talk a bit about contextuality um, and say a bit about the coach and specker approach and what we can say there. So here is the original formulation in their famous paper. Uh, there is no embedding of a partial Boolean algebra of projectors P of H into a Boolean algebra, where as long as the dimension is at least three. Uh, and we may wonder why, you know, why, why, why this property. Uh, actually, they considered a hierarchy of increasing, uh, they had a notion of non-contextuality and a sort of hierarchy of notions, and of course, if you negate non-contextuality or non-contextuality fails, then you get a notion of contextuality. So the strongest notion of non-contextuality for them is that A can be embedded in a Boolean algebra. Our failure to be everything to be compatible was just that we somehow forgot some compatibilities, but we can just sort of put them back in and don't change anything else, essentially just round out the algebra and complete it. So A is embedded in a Boolean algebra. Then uh, there's a more local version. Uh, there's a homomorphism to some Boolean algebra whose restriction to each Boolean subalgebra is an embedding. And the, weak, and the weakest contextuality is there is some homomorphism somewhere from A into some total Boolean algebra. So obviously these are sort of weaker properties as you go down here of, of non-contextuality. So saying that you can't do that gives us stronger properties of uh, contextuality. So in fact, the first condition is equivalent by sort of familiar fam uh, manipulations, familiar to in, in Boolean algebra, to saying there are enough homomorphisms from the partial Boolean algebra A into the two element Boolean algebra, which of course plays a very special role in Boolean algebra, the truth values. There are enough of these homomorphisms to separate elements of A. So for every sort of pair of elements that are neither zero nor one, uh, then you can find some homomorphism that sends one of them to zero and the other one to one. So this is, this is true for Boolean algebras and it relates to the prime ideal theorem. Um, uh, the, 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 the final one is, is on the other hand saying there is just some homomorphism from A into the two element Boolean algebra because any non-trivial Boolean algebra has some homomorphism to the two element Boolean algebra. So the strongest contextuality property is therefore there is not even one homomorphism from our partial Boolean algebra into the two element Boolean algebra. And this is actually what Cochin and Speck approve. Incidentally, this hierarchy is quite analogous to sort of recently discussed various strengths of contextuality, in particular strong versus logical uh, contextuality. Okay, now um, we might think that, you know, the, this, this statement of what Coach and Speck approved, I mean, the, the, doesn't it sort of seem to, I mean, and don't we have a problem with the result we were previously claiming? Because Boolean algebras are a full subcategory of partial Boolean algebras. We know that any partial Boolean algebra by that result of Hernan van der Berg is the co-limit of its Boolean subalgebras. Boolean algebras have co-limits, so we could take the same diagram of Boolean subalgebras and form a co-limit, and that cone, I mean all the maps from the Boolean subalgebras into this co-limit uh, in, in, uh, uh, as a Boolean algebra is also a cone in the world of partial Boolean algebras. So by our universal construction, the fact that, that A was a co-limit of the diagram in, in partial Boolean algebras, there would have to be a map from A to B. And this is actually perfectly correct. So doesn't that, how does that sit with this famous result by Cochin and Specker? Uh, well, um, the answer is that um, really Boolean algebras, um, I mean, have to, I mean, to be a reasonable category, I mean, uh, sort of things you define by equations and so on, they have to contain the one element Boolean algebra in which zero equals one. This is kind of the dirty secret of Boolean algebra, uh, which is often brushed under the carpet. Actually, it's, it, whenever you have an inconsistent theory, you can always turn a logical theory into its kind of Boolean algebra propositions. And this one element Boolean algebra is just the Boolean algebra of an inconsistent theory. 
And notice, by the way, that one does not have a homomorphism to two. Um, so these things are there. Uh, I mean, all that thing is there. And in the case of a partial Boolean algebra with a Koch and Specker property of not having a homomorphism to two, what that tells us then to avoid a contradiction with the other things we've seen is that the co-limit of its diagram of Boolean subalgebras must in fact be one. So one can arise not just as a terminal object, but as a co-limit of some big family of perfectly good um, uh, consistent Boolean algebras. But when you try and combine them all, then inconsistency will manifest itself. And we can turn this into a theorem, a little theorem. If A is a partial Boolean algebra, it's equivalent to say it has the Koch and Specker property, and that the co-limit of the diagram of Boolean subalgebras of A in the category of Boolean algebras is this one element inconsistent Boolean algebra. So Koch and Specker is all about classical inconsistency, we could say. And, and by that means, we can actually formulate the Koch and Specker property directly for diagrams of Boolean algebras without referring to partial Boolean algebras at all. But of course, you know, we, we are interested in that because that's what we connect with the, uh, the genuinely quantum. So we say that a diagram in, in, in Boolean algebras is Koch and Specker if its co-limit there is one. We can say that such a diagram is implicitly contradictory. If you look at each piece, it's consistent. All the, none of the Boolean algebras are trivial. But when we try and combine them all in this co-limit, we obtain the manifestly contradictory one element Boolean algebra in which zero equals one. So uh, that sort of chimes very well with the reading of contextuality as being about things that are locally consistent but globally inconsistent. Okay, so now we want to consider the relationship of Koch and Specker to the free extension of partial Boolean algebras by a relation. So we can see the versatility of this because we could take the relation on A to be the universal relation. In other words, we say everything should be commensurable. If we say that everything should be commensurable, we're forcing A to turn into a Boolean algebra. And it's quite easy to see that, that for A to have the Koch and Specker property is exactly equivalent to saying that our attempt to force it to be a Boolean algebra by making everything commensurable actually forces everything to collapse so that we get the one element Boolean algebra. And this is just a very easy working through of the universal property. So, um, okay. Now, um, <clears throat> the original hope, uh, as we said, with exclusivity is that we can sort of use it to home in on something closer to the quantum set. We know by now, you know, with various great recent results um, uh, by William Slofstro, who will speak in this meeting, uh, the recent MIP star equals RE, that there are sort of uh, what the quantum set is, is computationally a very, is a hard thing, non-computable problems lurking there. But the idea was to find principles that would get us, if not too, then close to the quantum set. And one of the characteristic features of quantumness are these remarkable quasi-paradoxes. So we might hope that our exclusivity reflection, which forces a partial Boolean algebra to be to satisfy logical exclusivity gets us closer to the quantum set. So the way we can formulate it in terms of our discussion here is that we can ask if extending commensurability by some relation can induce the Koch and Specker property when it didn't in, in the extended partial Boolean algebra when it didn't hold in the original one. And unfortunately, it's easily seen, again, using the, the sort of same properties we've been considering that this can never happen. So we can say this is the Koch and Specker faithfulness of extensions. If we take any relation, then A is Koch and Specker if and only if its extension is Koch and Specker. And this just works the universal property in a, in a simple fashion. If, if, the, if the extended relation had a morphism, we can certainly compose it with this, um, this eta, this kind of um, well not embedding, but map from the original one into A of R. Uh, and on the other hand, um, uh, by the universal property, if A was not Koch and Specker, then it has to lift to A of R. And that's kind of a bit disappointing. Okay, well, in, in the sense of uh, that, it, that we can't use that as a tool to get us uh, very close to the quantum set. Uh, 
And I want to finish up just by saying a little bit about these conditions of impossible experience. Um, so, um, and this is, I think, quite a remarkable thing in the original Coach and Specker work, which has somehow still not been, well, I don't feel I don't fully understand it, and I'm not sure I've seen um, anything that, um, and we have some specific questions that hopefully we can get to about it, which are certainly still open. Now, this construction is sufficiently versatile that even in the most trivial case, it still gives us something useful. So we can extend by the empty set, which of course is gonna give us something isomorphic to what we started with. But the good thing about that is that it gives us a kind of syntax, if you, because of the inductive way we were building up this free construction for talking about um, um, elements of the, uh, of the partial Boolean algebra that we started off with. So we can say that a, an ordinary Boolean algebra term is interpretable in A if, when you sort of um, build it uh, and um, um, uh, from the given and uh, uh, from the given generators um, uh, and uh, in this um, sort of free extension, which is really the same thing as A, that you can prove in our inductive system that it's defined. I mean, I should say that Coach and Specker have to go through something equivalent to this on an ad hoc basis uh, in, in their paper. We say that A satisfies T prime if this term is uh, interpretable and, uh, in, um, and uh, it's actually the same thing as the top element, the true element in this, in this Boolean algebra. And on the other hand, we know that um, just from classical logic and Boolean algebra, that a classical formula is unsatisfiable or contradictory exactly if the corresponding Boolean algebra term is provably equal to zero in the usual equational theory. Okay, so now here is, uh, I think, a remarkable result, as I say, by Cochin and Specker that is still not fully digested, uh, it seems to me, in all the subsequent work. So here's an equivalence for a partial Boolean algebra A. Firstly, A is Coach and Specker in the sense that we've already discussed. And secondly, there is some classical contradiction and in a way of assigning values in the partial Boolean algebra to the variables. Of course, to say you're a classical contradiction is to say whatever you substitute, as long as they're classical truth values, you're still gonna get the answer zero. But, but for this contradiction, we can find a way of assigning elements of the partial Boolean algebra to the variables, such that the partial Boolean algebra actually makes this formula true. So a contradiction can be realized as a truth in a partial Boolean algebra. So this is what I mean by uh, sort of impossible experience. Uh, well, I won't sort of uh, go into this. Uh, the, um, I mean, one, one thing goes quite nicely with our uh, uh, sort of um, formalism about these universal extensions. The, the other one inevitably comes back to the uh, compactness theorem of logic. Um, and that uh, since we're forcing everything, to, if we force everything to be commensurable, uh, that's going to collapse everything, then we can get a, a contradiction just from some finite number of uh, instance of the, of the um, way we've, we've sort of included the um, structure of the partial Boolean algebra in our, uh, in our extension. And, the, um, and we just collect the finitely many instances you need and that gives you the required contradiction. Okay, so if I have still a couple of minutes, that's one minute, uh, I'd just like to uh, finish up by, um, you see, we know that there are examples and there've been very ingenious study of examples and how small can we get examples uh, in, in three dimensions recent result that, you know, giving a limit on the number of vectors you need in any number of dimensions. But what is the, what is the general story about getting these contradictory formulas and making them true in partial Boolean algebras? So here is, here is a general description. And as far as I know, this is a fully general description in the sense that every um, thing we know is, is of this form. We have a family of propositional formulas each in a set of variables and they may overlap. And the conjunction of this family is a contradiction. It's unsatisfiable. 
And now we want to construct a partial Boolean algebra in which each formula is actually satisfied in the Boolean subalgebra. And since all subalgebras share the same top element, this means that you can interpret the conjunction in the whole thing. Conjunction of many copies of the top element is the top element, and the whole thing is actually satisfied in the partial Boolean algebra, even though classically this conjunction is a contradiction. So in order for this to succeed, each of the formulas we feed in should be neither a contradiction nor a tautology. If it were a contradiction, then the subalgebra would trivialize, and hence so would the whole partial Boolean algebra. And on the other hand, if every one was a tautology, this would contradict the conjunction of all of them being a contradiction. And in fact, if any of them are tautologies, we can safely omit them from the construction. And there's an interesting algebraic twist here. This is also saying that the subalgebras should be non-free since the formulas we have that we're collecting together are not tautologies, but we require them to be true. Um, and the recipe is sort of familiar to logicians. I mean, we can turn formulas into theory, I mean, as theories into Boolean algebras, uh, and then um, we can... Um, we can express the fact that they share variables by making a diagram in Boolean algebras. And since they're contradictory, the co-limit in, in, in Boolean algebras is going to be the one element Boolean algebra. And the idea is we form the co-limit in, in, in the world of partial Boolean algebras. And this should yield a partial Boolean algebra with the Koch and Specker property. So um, the question is, when is A a non-trivial partial Boolean algebra? If it is, then we've got ourselves a partial Boolean algebra uh, hosting a Koch and Specker contradiction. Uh, anytime it's non-trivial, that must be the case from the way we've constructed it. And at the moment, we know some examples where you do get that. And actually, the ones we know are the familiar Koch and Specker graph coloring paradoxes which arise when each formula expresses that exactly one of the variables in its set is true. And of course, this relates to having an orthonormal basis in the familiar fashion. On the other hand, we know other examples which are actually quite salient in quantum theory. So for those of you who've seen the sort of bundle diagrams with media strips relating to PR boxes and um, CHSH inequalities, so we have these are really liar cycles um, where you have a chain of sentences, each one saying the next is true until you finally get one saying the, the first one is false. And if you took that as your family of formulas, then actually um, everything gets collapsed to the one element algebra. So it doesn't always work. We don't always get a non-trivial example. So we'd like to understand which, um, which cases, perhaps by some criterion on the structure of the formulas, uh, do give us non-trivial Koch and Specker paradoxes. So uh, does every partial Boolean algebra which is Koch and Specker arise in this way? I, I, I would conjecture that it does. Um, and does every Koch and Specker partial Boolean algebra arise as a subalgebra of P of H for some Hilbert space H? So we really got things that can be realized in uh, quantum theory. Okay, so I think I've, um, yeah, I think I've used up my time, so I'd better stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Samson. Uh, so any, uh, any questions? Okay, if there's uh, nothing immediately coming up, maybe I can ask a question. And it is a very broad question. So, um, how shall I say? So there is a field of quantum computation and you may call that quantum logic if you are ignorant. Um, but then there's the, the real field of quantum logic. Uh, I mean, in, in, in the way that uh, Birkhoff von Neumann have originally defined. And somehow these two fields, it seems to me, never made contact with one another, never uh, kind of cross-fertilized one another. And so now you are, it seems to me that you're ditching one of the fundamental constructs of quantum logic, the lattices, and replace it by something else. So do you think you can, with your revised definitions, you can make contact with quantum computation? Um, 
Uh, yes, excellent question. And I, I think my answer is yes, for two reasons. Um, um, firstly, we can show that um, the sort of formalisms that have been used in, 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 in you know, things like um, Bell, Bell scenarios, non-locality scenarios, but more generally contextuality scenarios, the sort of way we formalize things with the sheaf theoretic approach, the graph theoretic approach, and similar things, um, and also, you know, things related to um, um, construction, you know, Perez Mermin and, you know, a large family of, of uh, constructions which play an important role nowadays in understanding, um, you know, the connections between contextuality and quantum advantage. So it's certainly quite a central issue in quantum computing. They can certainly be represented in this setting. Um, but the, 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 and I think it, I mean, one doesn't necessarily want to stay, I mean, I mean, I have, I have no fixed view about that, but um, the, the, the point, one thing that this setting opens up, which I've only kind of been able to hint at here, uh, is that um, we have an extra degree of freedom, which may actually be significant in the quantum computation examples, which is that we get the ability to use non-free Boolean algebras. Um, and certainly Koch and Specker paradoxes, um, they, the, these non-free algebras arise there, as I was just trying to say. Whereas if you look at the usual kind of Bell scenarios or the, the things we look at, the sheaf theoretic approach and so on, in general, the underlying events form a free Boolean algebra. You just look at all possible assignments and then you're looking at probabilities on those. So I think that the, there is something from using non-free algebras that may give us some extra kind of insight there. Um, so that's one kind of answer. The other one is something I didn't get time to speak about, but it is tensor product. And the big failure of, um, the big failure of uh, quantum logic and uh, why it didn't cross fertilize with quantum information, I think, uh, is that it never managed to give a decent account of the tensor product. And what got me really interested in, um, uh, in looking at Cochin's work, I mean, it was something that, that was in this uh, talk he gave at the Perimeter Institute a few years ago, was that he actually claimed in a recent paper to give a sort of logical account of the tensor product. Uh, unfortunately, this this doesn't quite work as, as, as he uh, claimed, but, um, but on the other hand, there are some rather remarkable results. I mean, he, um, which, in which you can show that you can generate the whole of the partial, you can generate the whole of the projections on a tensor product, certainly in finite dimensions, just by, from the local projectors, just by closing up under these partial Boolean operations. Uh, so in other words, just by forming products of commuting projectors and complements of projectors, starting from the local projectors, you can get all projectors. That's not an obvious thing. Even more interesting, and, and something that I still kind of uh, trying, I mean, this is one of, this is a fascinating result by Conway and Cochin. So they, uh, I mean, in one, of the, one of the basic facts about Boolean algebras is that a finitely generated Boolean algebra is finite. This is, comes directly from, you know, disjunctive normal forms or conjunctive normal forms, or whatever. So what they show is that once you go to C4, this is no longer true in the partial Boolean algebra P of C4. And in fact, what they show is if you start from the local Paulis, actually five of the six local Paulis, I mean, excluding the, you know, the identity, um, uh, uh, but just five of them, and you close up under these partial Boolean algebras, you get a dense, uniformly dense subset of the whole projection, of the whole space of projectors, which is quite a remarkable result that unfortunately has never been, I mean, it's only published as the, the sort of transcript of a, of a lecture, in fact. Um, so, uh, so I th anyway, I think there, I think we're, we're sort of with modern language about, you know, uh, taking into account monoidal structure and so on. I think we, th this point could be revisited. And I think one of the things we would, we would hope to do is to give a logical account of the tensor product. 
if we can do that, then I think a lot of connections with quantum information and quantum computation become accessible. So apologies for the long answer.